Welcome to the Art of Starting Up. My name is Abe Leachy and I'm your host. And today we're going to be talking with Adam Cohen Aslati, the founder and CEO of Something More or S'more, which is a next gen dating app, which uh, is very cool. And full disclaimer, Adam and S'more, they're a client of mine and I'm also an investor in the company. So whoever needs to know that, now you know, and we can move on to the interview. So Adam, first of all, Thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is the first episode of the podcast and couldn't think of anybody better to have than you. So thank you. Very much appreciate it. And uh, so I guess tell us about S'more. Yeah. So as you mentioned, S'more is a next generation dating app. I actually call it a relationship app because the premise of the application is really to transition an entire generation of swipers that are millennials, my generation, your generation into long term relationships. And the premise for the product is getting to know someone before deciding if you like them and even before you see them. So the more that you interact with someone on the app and the more that you chat with someone on the app, the more their photos begin to unblur and their private and visual content begins to unlock. So walk, walk us through it. So when you go onto the app and you link with somebody, so their photo is, is fully blurred, right? So how do you, I know you interact with it, but if you can just explain to everybody how that works and you know what the user experience is uh, when you're using the app and unlocking a photo. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we, the just backing up the genesis of, of S'more, something more, is to not judge someone based on the way that they look. And the majority of mainstream dating apps, dating apps out there, regardless of if they claim to be for casual or for longer term relationships, they were focused on image. And as a millennial, we know uh, we live in the Instagram generation. It's so hard to get past a photo. But if there isn't a photo there, then it's much easier to have this authentic, real conversation and to really be who you are. And so the way that the now going back to the blur mechanism, the way that it works is we give you five recommended profiles per day. And those five recommended profiles are based in part on the way that you set up your profile, so the different things that you added into it, as well as your behavior on the app. So we suggest five most compatible people to you. And then all you know is two traits about that person and their name. And then you sort of go on this exploratory journey to figure out who these people are. So if I'm George from Brooklyn and I'm a doctor, all you know is George, Brooklyn, doctor. You go to my profile and you begin to interact with all the multimedia elements on the profile and the profiles feel much more like a collage. It's very unstructured mm -hmm. and you have to kind of figure out where things are. And as you begin to tap or what we like to call a wink, show interest in that person, their profile photo begins to respond to that and it begins to unblur. And when you're setting up a profile, you can choose kind of what uh, elements are highlighted for when people see your profile first, like the first two or three elements. Yes, you can choose all of them. Uh, basically, in the collage, not only are you choosing traits and cool things about yourself, but there's also your ability to add music to your profile. So we even we can hear your voice and listen to the music that you like even before we see the way you look. And research shows that people are more sexually attracted to voice. And voice can also be a deal breaker. You might find someone who's beautiful and then when you hear them speak, it's like a little cringeworthy. Right. So being able to hear their voice and then maybe when after you see their photo, maybe they weren't the your ideal or what in your mind you thought your type was, but their voice was so attractive to you that you give them a shot at love, which is what our app is, is trying to do or what, what our app does. And you have these conversations, which then hopefully lead you into relationships. And, uh, you know, using your terminology, uh, cause I know that you prefer using the term relationship app as opposed to dating app. Like, you know, everybody knows dating app, dating app. Uh, I just want to, just talk a little bit about why you make that distinction and, and why you think there is a difference between a relationship app and a dating app. Yeah, I mean, so I've been in the industry for a very long time uh, and most of the, the, most of the first gen uh, apps in the space were for casual encounters. It was based on location. So mm -hmm. whenever you added location into an app, you can find all these potential people around you. And for casual encounters, having a carrot, which is the photo, uh, generates potentially more interactions. But you cannot judge a book by its cover. Our generation, we were led to believe, as maybe you'll agree with me, everything 
is on demand. You have an iPhone yeah. or the iPhone generation. You can order a pizza to your house. You can buy tickets online. You can do everything instantly. The difference is relationships are not on demand and they're not made to order. There's a process that goes, you must go through. And so S'more sort of codifies what that process is. And we say, if you want a relationship, you have actually got to know the person first before you start to judge them just based on the way they look. So our app, the intention of using the app is for people who really want to be, have a boyfriend, have a girlfriend, be in long, longer term relationships. It's not really meant for a hookup, a, boot, a booty call. Like We're just not that app. Right. And again, no shade. And there's maybe a use case for that. We all have maybe experienced that or have friends that have experienced that. We're just focused on people who want to get into these longer term coupling up type of relationships. Yeah. And, and I think something else that's really cool and somewhat unique about your app is, uh, I think you call it the kindness score, right? And I guess you just talk a little bit about that because I know that behavior user or, you know, person behavior on in the community is, is really important to you. So if you could just explain a little bit how that works and, and where you see that kind of affecting the community building. Yeah. So one of the biggest pain points in the dating industry, whether it's a casual app or a relationship app is the uh, people's behavior, especially men on some of these casual apps tend to not be that great. You send to send people nudies uh, or just send really awful messages to people. And we know that the behavior leads to people to be turned off from your app. So if right. your app is about relationships, which it is, that means that every single feature that we create has to support long terms, more substantial, more um, like together type of relationships, which we do. One of the differences is we created something called a kindness score and a kindness score is a score that lives on your profile. It's publicly visible and it's based in part on how you behave on the app. So when you're chatting with someone, the app automatically messages both people and it says, is the other person being polite and kind? That score is factored into your kindness score that lives on your profile. And we know other examples like Uber, nobody wants a low score. So everyone right. acts better in order to have a higher score, which means everyone hopefully on our community will behave in a better way because they want to have a higher score. But maintaining authenticity, obviously. I Correct. mean, yeah. And another thing that I think is really interesting, uh, I guess a solution to a problem that is really commonplace in dating apps is the whole idea of catfishing and you guys have developed a i guess a verification system so i wanted to know if you could just explain a little bit about that and you know why you have it in there what it is and how you think it'll affect the quality of the users or the people on the app yeah that's a great question because one of another challenge in the industry is obviously people pretending to be someone that they're not and i think that a lot of these larger communities, it's easier to have a very low barrier to entry so anyone could create a profile. But at the same time, you're letting in people that are bad actors, even bots, and there's a lot of catfishing. So people that are claiming to be someone who they're actually not. If we are about relationships, then we have to have a community that's only made up of people that are real and that actually want relationships. That is one of our sort of filters. And uh, in 2018, many of the mainstream apps began to make verification optional. We said in 2020, it needs to be required by every single person. So when you create a profile in S'more, on S'more, you must also take a selfie. That selfie is compared with the photos that you uploaded to see if the person behind the iPhone is the same person of the photos that were uploaded. And if there's a match, then we think you're a real person and then you can start chatting with people on the app. Do you feel like it might present any sort of barrier to entry? I mean, I'm sure you've given that some thought and what are your thoughts on that? 100% yes. I think that a lot of consumers felt or, or do feel that their data has been compromised by other companies and maybe don't feel uh, secure even taking a picture of themselves. What's going to happen with this picture? Right. At S'more, we take the picture and instantly destroy it. We don't use it. We don't store it. We just want to know that you're real. Um, but it's an extra step that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. Potentially, it's also new. So when we require it, it will decrease the number of people coming back into S'more, but then the quality of the audience will go up tremendously. So we think that we'll have higher quality of users, of people on the app, um, probably maybe smaller quantity as compared to some of the mainstream apps. 
or at least in the beginning i think yeah. once the kind of the concept is is really spoken about i mean you guys just launched but i think once people realize like hey i'm not gonna get catfished like i'm gonna see who these people really are after they're unblurred yes and uh you know people start finding love and really forming real relationships i think that i mean you know this is a little uh, cliche or whatever but the power of love is is you know this it's indescribable and i think that if you have something that can actually help people find that mm -hmm. it's just like it's going to take off because yes. people want that so badly especially in this digital age it seems like everybody's so disconnected from each other so if you have something where you can actually interact with something other than an image i think that mm. i think it's brilliant and i guess to that point aside from the company like tell us about you the man behind the company you know what were you doing before this what led you to start s'more Okay, so the founding story is an interesting story. I started my first dating website when I was a graduate student at Harvard, and I was 22, and I found it really challenging to meet people in different graduate schools. There are 12, or there are 12 graduate schools. So I petitioned the provost's office to give me some money so I can build a website to solve a problem that I thought a lot of other students had. Uh, so we built a website where you can go online, and you create a profile, and you tell us, if you're looking to meet someone from the design school, divinity school, your age preference, and very basic things, and this was in 2008. Then we hosted these speed meeting events. We wanted to use dating, but that did not work out so well. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a speed meeting. Uh, and then you're able to meet 15 people at these events, and if there was a match, if you liked someone and someone liked you, you go back online, and email addresses would be automatically exchanged. So. That was you know, over 10 years ago, that's kind of how I started. And then I went to work for a company called Kpasa, which is today called The Meet Group. Sure. And they are publicly traded, they own seven dating apps. Uh, and since then I've also consulted and worked for some uh, other large, uh, large dating companies. You worked for uh, Chappie, or you were the director there, I think, right? Yeah, so I was the managing director of Chappie, which is Bumble's gay dating app. Right, and so after that, you know, where did, where did this idea even come from? I mean, it's such a specific idea. And I'm just curious, how do you think of it? And how do you think, hey, I'm actually going to do this? I don't know. I'm crazy. Uh, <laughs> but I, but, but to, be, to be honest with you, I was in Mexico. I was in Cabo. And I was trying to figure out what next to do with my life. Uh, should I continue and work uh, in the industry, at other companies, or something else? And, something more. Or something more, exactly. <laughs> uh, and actually, I met a woman on the beach, and we inevitably started talking about relationships. If you find me on the street, I'm probably talking about relationships. This is, was always ingrained uh, in me. And what was interesting is she was telling me about her experiences on all these dating apps, and she felt like she had to put a version of herself out there to attract men that wasn't always authentic, that mm -hmm. she would beautify herself or face tune herself. And she felt like she was in competition with other women for the attention of a man. And she was beautiful, but she was not a size two. And she was just telling me about all these negative experiences. She was even catfished. She went to a restaurant. She met and had dinner with this guy who was completely a different person to the guy <laughs> who she was talking to online. And, and it's so crazy that that happens, by the way. And by the way, I feel like that happens very often. And having spent so lo so long in the industry, I did feel a little bit demoralized, but also inspired because I knew that we can solve her problem, but no one was really doing it. And so I spent the next 24 hours and I came up really with the full concept of s'more, which was stop judging this person. Stop making her feel like she has to be inauthentic to attract someone. You should fall in love with who she really is. And that sounds also cliche, but at the end of the day, relationships, if you don't love the whole person and you can't love them when they look their worst, it right. is not going to work out for you. Uh, yeah. So why are, we, why are we delaying that process? Let's just get to know the whole person first and then find out what they look like. And that's the impetus for S'more. Nice. And then, I mean, we, I know this story because I, I was there, but um, if you could just share kind of like how you started the journey from ideation to you know to actually launching i mean i know we had met so yes. yeah so that's that part, that's but. a really funny story too because so uh, my husband and i were looking for a rental house um in the summer and we went to your house and we fell in love with you and your wife and your children 
and we Likewise. started, <laughs> yeah, and we started to talk about, you know, what I did, what you did, and and what have you, and. I think I just brought up the concept of, you know, I I came up with this concept called S'more, or actually I don't even know if there, 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 I think if you're there's calling a name. It something, oh yeah, I don't know if there was a name. There we might have been a the name. We had the concept, and I was talking with you about, should I go into the workforce and work for a really cool financial company in the app space, or should I do this, I, this S'more idea and just kind of be crazy? And you were very bullish on, <laughs> this, is, this is your time. I mean, if you don't do it now, then you'll think about what if. Yeah. I'm biased, but I, I remember being, <laughs> I remember when you left, I was like, was I like too much with uh, <laughs> too with aggressive <laughs> yeah. or just aggressive enough? <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently I guess just aggressive yes. enough. And then I know we met just, I know I don't want to bore everybody with the story, but we met, uh, I think the Monday after even, and yeah. like magically you actually had a deck together, yeah. <laughs> which I, I was very surprised with. And like, literally, I think you decided like, Hey, I'm going to do this. And formed the company and started fundraising so i guess like you made the decision but what was that like in your head were you like was it like were you fearful scary or just like just purely excited because uh, i actually don't know i mean I know we we talked about this story but like what was going on in your head when you decided hey i'm gonna do this oh i don't know i think i i don't i th i was so outside of my comfort zone and by the way I'm still so outside of my comfort zone. <laughs> Every day I'm you outside of my me. comfort zone. And uh, it's not always a good feeling to feel that way, like 24 seven, but I know that we're doing something that's really positive. And I think that that what's, you know, that's what really keeps me going. But yeah, I think that the investment side of things is something that I was really unfamiliar with. I understood how to run a business. I understood the economics behind dating. And I knew that there was a need for something like this, but I had never built an app from scratch before and nor had I fundraised. And there was, it, it's for sure a skill, which I didn't think that I had. I mean, it's like uh, a, almost a full-time job. Yes. I mean, and just so our viewers know, and you're probably too modest to say this, so I'll say it for you. But I mean, you, you, like you said, you had zero fundraising skills. I think you started fundraising in June, maybe. What I think was, and by September you had closed a round of over a million dollars from you know angels and VCs. Yeah, literally having never done this before, which yeah. was shocking to me and to me. And to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was that process like? I think a lot of the viewers and listeners who are likely thinking about getting to the startup world or are founders, you know, one of the biggest things is fundraising. So, if you could just talk a little bit about what that was like and you know any any advice that you'd give to to people thinking about doing that any pitfalls they could avoid or anything like that yeah so it's it's a skill that i didn't think that i had only because i had never done it before but at the end of the day i think that everyone's always selling you're always selling an idea or yourself or a concept whether you're an engineer or an actual salesperson or a marketing person and what have you and so i just felt like we had a very authentic story and a product that was needed to be told like a, a product that needed to come to life and i was cold emailing i was linkedin ing i don't know if that's a word <laughs> linkedin in -ing? Li linkedin -ing, ing and linking uh, in, uh -huh. linking in <laughs> and using my network and friends of friends speaking at conferences uh pitching at conferences i really did everything and i never stopped and for me uh it's not even that that failure wasn't an option but i just never thought we wouldn't do it. I knew somehow we were going to get to what our goal was. And some days were really sad. And some days, you know, you go through this emotional roller coaster, which I'm still going through. I thought it would have ended when we fundraised. <laughs> it, it, the fundraising it's not going to end ever. <laughs> it's literally every day. So you need to be very strong internally <laughs> and have a good support system. But I think, you know, from the fundraising perspective, I was getting advice left, right and center from VCs and angels. And everyone was telling me what to do and what the formula was. And you need this product and then you do a beta and then and there is a formula that people go through and are successful with. And I just never really followed rules, to be very honest with you. And not in a bad way. I mean, I, I, I'm not intentionally trying to break rules, but I always felt like I was the underdog in life. This is not just about s'more. And I was always fighting for what I thought was right and doing it my way or doing it a different way. And this is no different. I didn't care really what that someone said. I couldn't because I didn't have a product yet. I was going to do it this way. So before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you if you had any advice for somebody thinking about starting their own company or even just getting into the dating or relationship app space, what you would tell them 
uh, for a newbie? So I think that there are, there are a lot of dating or relationship apps out there and some of them are really cool and have unique features. I always, while I think that S'more is very cool product wise, I don't believe that investors should put money into something that's just cool unless it's a moonshot, like totally different right. technology idea. Um, but you should fundamentally have a business and fundamentally S'more had a business model from day one. So yes, we're solving a bigger problem. The other thing I think is important is you can't think of your business as a product. And I never thought about S'more as we're creating a cool dating app or relationship app or app at all. We're creating a brand. And if the brand, especially in the consumer space, doesn't resonate with your consumers and doesn't stand in our case for something more, <laughs> then you are never going to be successful. Then your brand doesn't have longevity. So for us, yeah, something, something more s'more today is a relationship app where we're about helping you connect people for the long term, more substantial type of relationships, et cetera. But something more is a rallying cry for people who think that they deserve something more in life. Right. This is stage one, but stage two could be an infinite number of verticals that we can go into. And we do believe that people become emotional about the brands that they use, become evangelists for those brands. And that's what creates real businesses. We're not building an app. We're not building a feature. We're building a massive company with S'more. I love it. And then if you want to just tell everybody quickly, I know that you guys launched in D.C. and in Boston. Hey, what What's the road ahead for cities and and I guess why are you doing it and just starting in cities themselves and not just doing a national campaign yeah that's a that's a really good question because a dating app or relationship app it takes two to tango in our case <laughs> so which means you need to have a network in a city before you launch in that city so how do you create that network effect so we need to have wait listers in a city before we even go into it because from day one you need to have hundreds or thousands of people, otherwise there's no one to match with. So right. it may be easier for a gaming app or an app where you're just by yourself there doing your own thing. Um, it's much more complicated in a community type of experience for us. That makes um, sense. And for us, we chose Boston and DC as our, as our prime launch cities because we are targeting first and foremost millennials, my generation, people, millennials, by the way, throw this fun fact in, they're the single largest and oldest generation in American history to be so single. 50% wow, of that millennials. Is, uh, that's actually sad. Surprise. <laughs> sad, yes. <laughs> Surprising too, but I guess it makes sense now they're saying it. I didn't know that. But 50% of the millennials, so 40 million Americans report being single and some say hopelessly single. And what's interesting is the percentage of Americans that say they're looking for relationships and looking to be married hasn't changed since the 1970s. So it's not that people don't wanna be in relationships, but something has changed in our environment. And in my view, our environment, our behaviors have changed because of the iPhone. It's very easy to order pizza on demand and even maybe something casual encounters on demand relationships are not made to order and you cannot order a relationship to your home. It's a good way to put it actually. So S'more has to reinvent the way that those relationships are formed from the ground up. So we're literally reteaching a whole generation, my generation, how you actually create relationships. And it's not based on the way that you look. By the way, physical appearance, totally important, but there's sound, there's interest, there's opinions, there's values. Those things are long-term. And so that's why our app is for the long-term. So if somebody wants something more, how do they get it? Where is it available? What's the website? So yeah, so we are available on iOS right now. So mm -hmm. you can go to the app store and if you type in S'more Date or S'more Dating, we will pop up, tell all of your friends. Uh, we'll be launching across the country by the end of the year and probably half the country by June. So we're only at the beginning stages. We are, our full product hasn't even launched yet. We have, you know, parts and pieces of it that are live. Uh, but in the next few months, it'll be fully available for everyone to download. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. And uh, again, I'm glad that it was you on the first episode. <laughs> and thank you guys for listening and for watching, if you're watching this video. And stay tuned for another episode of The Art of Starting Up. Thanks.